Hey, welcome back to Snowflake Summit, everybody. My name is Dave Vellante, and we're here and really excited to welcome you to the great iceberg debate with George Gilbert and Sanjeev Mohan. Guys, thanks for coming back on theCUBE. I'm going to set it up, and then we'll get into it. So yesterday, as you know, we had an extremely enlightening conversation. This is something I posted on LinkedIn with a little bit more detail. We had Christian Kleinerman and Snowflake's visionary founder, uh, Benoit Dajaville, and what I called somewhat of a convenient truth hmm. is that it's really hard to actually create standards across all the compute engines Correct. from a governance standpoint and a catalog standpoint. So what Snowflake is doing is they're open sourcing Polaris, which is really just the technical metadata. So the somewhat inconvenient or the convenient truth for Snowflake is that the standards for governing open table formats like Apache Iceberg are not only lacking, but they're extremely challenging due to, you got to herd the cats of all the various compute engine players and, and agree and then align. Why would Snowflake take on something like that? So Snowflake, they're open sourcing Polaris, but if you want the, the, the governed yep. sort of catalog, you got to go to Horizon, you got to come back Correct. into uh, the Snowflake playground. Seems like a reasonable strategy. Yeah, well thought out. What's your take on this? So, if you look at, uh, at Iceberg, Iceberg table spec, that's what it is. It's a table format, does not specify certain things like permission. There are no permission, there's no security. Security has to be applied above uh, in, a, in a different catalog. So, uh, Iceberg, uh, so Snowflake actually provides this Polaris catalog, which is a technical metadata catalog, that's it. But if you want to do uh, RBAC, uh, row level security, column level security, you want to do that kind of stuff, the, you need Horizon, that does not come. If you don't have Horizon, then every single compute engine, like if it's Spark or, or Dremio or Trino uh, or Starburst, they have to figure out how to apply uh, data access governance onto, uh, uh, onto Iceberg. So that's why Horizon is so important. So when Sanjeev talks about technical metadata, George, explain what that is and what's the value of that. Okay, so when you update a table, um, there's a data that says this is, this is all the parquet files that are in the table, these are the columns. Um, in that table, it's just really basic. It's a, a way to say all this, this collection of row groups forms a table, that's it. As Sanjeev said, you want, you want to know, you know permissions, that's somewhere else. You want to know the lineage, um, but the, the, the kernel that says the source of truth, what is the state of the table when you update it, when you, when you write to that table, that's the technical metadata. And so what I found out today was the reason why Polaris was open sourced is so that for iceberg tables, you can read and write um, independent of a catalog where in Unity, which is trying to have both Delta and Iceberg and, and Hootie support, they have not only the technical metadata, but all the other, the lineage, the, the permissions, all the things that are in Horizon. But, but they're bundling it. So, in other words, if you wanted to read and write to the open table formats, you had to take the entire Delta, the, the entire Databricks catalog. Now, by getting everyone to agree that Polaris or some other catalog is enough, then they can break that link, they can break that bundle. And then you're back to, are you in the Horizon family for all the, the richness? of governance or are you then into unity for all the riches? This is why I feel like it was a, a, a well thought out strategy. It's like let's compete on the basis of our product and let the customers decide. Now, we should mention that just as Benoit Dajaville was getting on stage today, Databricks dropped the press release that they were going to acquire. Tabular, Wall Street Journal reported it. It was, it was positioned as an AI announcement. We can talk about <laughs> whether or not that's, yeah. that's the case. We, we don't think it is. But the timing was you know, not coincidental. Wh right. wh what, what was your takeaway uh, of that announcement in terms of its, what does it mean for the, the customer and but specifically for, for the sort of battle between Databricks so and Snowflake? I, I, I don't think this is a good move for the customers. 
I, in fact, had lunch with some very large companies, financial services, and they said we put our eggs in iceberg basket because we were getting an open standard file format, and now hoodie is actually not really uh, as uh, prevalent. There are only two, Delta and Iceberg, and they're both owned by the same company. And so that's, that's the, how the customers feel. Now the reality is that Iceberg, the bus has already left the station. It's open source, everybody is doing Iceberg uh, at this point. So uh, the question that begs is, well, how much impact does this have towards Iceberg if Iceberg has already been implemented? So George, your thinking on this is the, 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 what we sometimes call the six data platform is, not just about separating compute from storage, that's what Snowflake popularized with cloud data warehouses. It's really about separating compute from the data. So any compute engine can operate on, on any data, and that's the, the vision that you've put forth. And so, how does that apply here? Okay, so, you know, we've had, on breaking analysis, we had Ryan from Tabular, who's the target of this acquisition. Right. And we did another show with Ryan and one of the um, architects of Starburst just recently on, on uh, Road to Intelligence. Is, uh, Ryan Blue. Ryan yeah. Blue. Yeah. So what, what the, the value they're trying to add now um, is I think it might be fairly straightforward or, or will be soon to be able to just read and write whether it's in Delta or Iceberg. There's a, the, the, the basic abstraction is, is the same where all the work that Ryan and the tabular group were doing was adding on the permissions um, and to go beyond just like authentication and row-based access control, they were trying to add a full policy engine, which is tag, this is the really advanced um, where you, where you um, control access to data based on its attributes. That's, that's the full-blown stuff. That's what they're building. And the, the whole point is you can't separate compute from storage, as you guys were saying, until you put the security but the security now, it's no longer enough just to say, are you allowed to access, you know, are you in this role? The, the, next, the next level is, can, do you, can you apply this policy? And that's, so the, I think what Databricks is buying is not just the table interoperability, but someone who's building a policy engine, because they tried to buy a Muta. But, but, okay, but so but to simplify it, you're basically saying, to get that governance it, it, with Snowflake, you got to go to Horizon, Horizon. Where, whereas you're saying, in theory, with Unity, you can bring that governance to the data, even though they're both proprietary. Yeah. It's not a matter of open source or not, but isn't Unity built on top of Hive? So the question then becomes, like, how robust so, is that capability? So talking about Hive, uh, it, it just seems to me that we have regressed. We've gone 2013. back. Yes, so we have. Is it really on yes, Hive? Yes, it's built on Hive. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, well, I mean even, the, even the, if it is, they, they can port that. That's right, something. Of course, a, but yeah. it's a, that's so, the core, right? So, Am I right? Uh, it, so they, they took inspiration from Hive, but the situation that we are in now is a combination of Hive and Ranger. It reminds me of Redshift. Yeah, <laughs> so Hive and Ranger. By, by the way, just, just to clarify, there's, there are a lot of moving parts that are going on in parallel, and they're not talking to each other. For example, uh, on stage today at Keynote, uh, Microsoft announced this bi-directional connection with Snowflake. They, they already announced it at Microsoft Build. Interesting, that's a shot yes. across Databricks bow. Right, yeah. so, so, but the question is, what is my, how is Microsoft doing this, and what's the role of Polaris? But it's, this is what I'm saying, the, it's a separate project. And that project is, uh, you know this, uh, the X table. Yeah. So what, what uh, happens is Microsoft Fabric is built on one lake which uses Delta, that's it. But when you, when you write something into Delta, then using one house, open source Apache X table, they're converting the, the catalog entries into Iceberg. Yeah, so. And then that then can then that, read. That's the, that's the table abstraction. That's, that's so yeah, that everyone can read and write the table. But the, right. the, the next step is to take the, govern, the security part right. and attach it to the, to the table. And right. that's what the tabular guys were building. That's what Starburst guys are building. And that's what today is in Unity and Horizon. But the, um, basically, I think what, what's um, 
Polaris was trying to break apart the technical metadata from Unity, but then um, Tabular and so, someone, the next effort is to, to apply security directly to the technical metadata, to grow it out of the technical metadata, and then Horizon and Unity would be value add you know, metadata uh, catalog. But normally this type of competition you would think is good for customers, but in this case I think you're right, it's, it's maybe not so good for customers because there's all these competing standards. Right. We, rem we remember well Hortonworks and Cloudera. Correct. Right? And so, yeah. and, and finally the market said, well, just bring them together. Yeah, but it was too and, late, and, the cloud had already disrupted yes. them. How, how did these guys avoid that happening? But, but go ahead, make your point. Yeah, so I was just going to say, uh, by the way, there's also AWS Glue Catalog, which has also been adding features like, for example, one of the things that Catalog does is the Catalog doesn't just have the technical metadata, it also knows the statistics, so you can do query planning. Yeah, but then there's other metadata in data zones Right, so that's yeah. not unified. Which is like Horizon. <laughs> so Data Zone is like Horizon, Glue Catalog is like Polaris, and, and Unity is sort of in between. But, but you guys are, are all talking about the, the value add. They're, we're trying to solve first so that it doesn't matter what the table format is. Whether yes. it's X table or whether Ryan and, and the Delta guys fix what uniform was announced right. by Databricks. We're, we're going to fix the table interoperability, so it doesn't matter whether it's Iceberg or, or Delta, so, so you know, then it's what else are you adding onto that. Right, so I, I think there's a basic problem. The basic problem is, do you get interoperability with vendor lock-in or not? Um, but it dep Tim, depends what type of interoperability. Like, like if, the, if security is attached to the data, then then you have interoperability for the, the data policy and the governance, but you don't, then you go to the value add for all the lineage and the observability right. and the quality. So I think what's happening is there's going to be a base core that is growing all the time in capability. That, and but that wait, base core is, is, that is the common. The but common is that at Polaris or is that at Horizon? Um, it cannot be at Polaris. It's not, yeah. um, Horizon is going to be the bigger value add. The, the, and what we don't know, um, Polaris. So Polaris we, cannot have security. No, well, it's not that it can't, it does not now. But, and, but the and thing. Databricks but, is, the, 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 what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that Databricks is trying to solve so that you can read and write Iceberg and Delta, and then the next thing that they can so, add is a so policy these, and these are for two, security. These are two orthogonal projects is what I'm saying. Yes. The X table, the cross uh, connection is one project, Polaris is a separate project, and right now nobody knows how these two projects will and, operate. And what Benoit or uh, Christian said is you can't ignore, because I asked the question, irrespective of the, of the, the, the technology challenges, is it your intent to bring over that security capability, the governance capabilities to Polaris? And he said, you can't ignore the technical challenges. It's, you got to get all the, the engine, the compute engines to agree, and that's virtually impossible. So why do you think that Databricks is going to be able to succeed at getting that agreement? It's, because it's all integrated in it's, there. They're trying to add a policy engine. Um, Starburst is adding a policy engine. Um, Salesforce is adding a policy, and that's the next thing beyond role-based access control. Right, so that's, it's more stovepipes. Um, actually, no, because um, if you have a policy engine, then the thing you want to standardize on, just like metrics and the semantic layer, the tags on the data that says this is, you know, PII. You this harmonize is, that. Okay. That, yes, if you yep. if you harmonize the tags, the policy engines respect that. Okay. So then it's it's who's going to add policy. I want to to share with something else. I said, I'm really curious to see how this plays out at the time. Customers want it all. They want openness, they want no lock-in, they want an integrated experience. Yep. They want the cake, they want to eat it too, and they don't want yep. to gain weight. Right? <laughs> That's and, what they and want. And they want it to cure cancer. And they want it to cure cancer. So in my decades of following these markets, yeah. you may recall Unix used to be considered open. It was synonymous with open source. And so I feel like this discussion is just so advanced. But I, so Dave, I think this was another nail in the coffin of open source. That's my, my <laughs> because just this year, how many open source uh, things? Redis, Terraform, uh, a couple of new ones I, I'm, I'm missing. The, the, so you just see this all the time that you know these open source. Get absorbed, right? Yeah. And, and oh, actually, no, I know which one I'm thinking. It was this Kafka Connect, which became Benthos, and then Red Panda bought it just last week. 
took it out of. Well, hats off to IBM. They've done a good job with, with Red yeah. Hat. I, yeah. I will give them credit. But what happens to One House? Are they going to get acquired? <laughs> I, actually, I talked to One House today. Really? Yeah, I had a call with them, and uh, and they don't know. Like they, they, I don't think they knew this was. No, this coming. is not. Yeah, yeah. The One House. A lot of people knew this was coming, but apparently. Uh, apparently, Snowflake was in the bidding. Oh, Snowflake was in the bidding. Coalesce was yeah, in the bidding. There was a rumor that Snowflake Confluent, was going to buy Tabular. Google Cloud. Oh, they all were. They were all in the bidding. Oh. Another nail in the coffin for open yes, source. But, but Go ahead, George, give us the last you know, word. I, I wouldn't lament the, the loss of open source too much because the, you know, what, what we've seen from, from Amazon for 15 years was they expropriate open source projects and that the real value is in, in making the open source run as a service. And so yeah, this is a managed just, service, for yes, sure. Yes, this is the same thing here. But what we're trying to do is just make sure that the APIs are standardized. The APIs for how to tag data. The APIs for you know how to define a policy for your data. And that's just growing. We're going to agree on the data table format. Then we're going to agree on how to you know tag policies. And then you know then we're on to the value add metadata. So right, we're getting we're getting thrown out of the the. Okay. the the park here, so we got to go. Thanks you guys, really Thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much. To be continued, yeah. this is a really yes. interesting conversation. All right, keep it right there. For more coverage, come, come see, the, go to thecube.net tomorrow, siliconangle.com for all the news. Go to thecuberesearch.com. My name is Dave Vellante for Rebecca Knight. We're out, we'll see you tomorrow. Snowflake Summit 2024 from Moscone. All right. Thank you. Hi everybody, we're here at Moscone South. This is the Wednesday, actually, of Snowflake Summit 2024. Really excited to be back in San Francisco and even more excited to have Sridhar Ramaswamy, who's the CEO, newly minted CEO of Snowflake. Thanks so much for spending some time on theCUBE. Super excited to be here at theCUBE. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So, okay, first, the thing I want to ask you is, you've met with, I think, over 100 customers that's right, now. That's right, that's right, that's right. I'm on the road every other week. Well, <laughs> that's the only way you can meet 100 <laughs> customers in a short time frame. What, are you, what have you been learning? What have you taken away from those conversations? The first thing, uh, and it really warms your heart as a CEO, is just the amount of respect and trust that people have for Snowflake. Um, and a lot of our customers run pretty much all of their data on Snowflake, they want us to do more. This is where the things that we announced today around Iceberg, or what we are doing with Polaris, they are all a big deal, because that's what a lot of big customers want. On the other hand, a lot of excitement about AI, people don't quite know how to get started, and they're looking to us for what are simple, effective, cost-effective ways in which to get started with AI. So I end up talking about our roadmap, what is possible, the kind of applications, whether it's chatbots or Cortex analysts talking to your data. Um, so it generally tends to fall into, into one of these two buckets. So anytime you have a CEO change and a highly, very successful company, people want to know, well, who is this guy? And so you are a product you know, person first. Tell us a little bit about sort of your, <laughs> your mission in life, your, your, your passion for, for product. Yeah, uh, so I'm a computer scientist by training. Funnily enough, did a PhD in databases uh, many years ago and worked at places like Bell Labs on things like query processing. And so I feel very much at home at Snowflake. You know, this is where I've spent the vast majority of my life. Uh, but it was really at Google that I spent over 15 years that I learned the power of combining amazing technology with amazing product to build a great business. I worked on Google search pretty much since day one. It was a $1.6 billion business the day I joined. I left it, um, it was $100 billion, and I ran that team for the better part of uh, 10 plus years. Um, and uh, it's really in making uh, product and business come together that I get joy and satisfaction. And again, meeting with all of these customers, hearing from them about how important Snowflake is to their business, that's what gets me excited. It's conversations like this about the impact that uh, we can have. I love technology, but I love making a difference to people's lives. So being part of that incredible growth, you've got to be an optimist, of, co of course. Uh, my, however, my co-CEO and, and co-founder, John Furrier, 
called you a wartime AI CEO. Do you, do you feel like we're in an AI war that the pace of play is so fast that you have to have that, that mindset? Uh, the pace of play is absolutely a little breathtaking. Uh, the thing that I will call out about my tenure uh, as the leader of ads is I brought a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. I brought a drive to seize opportunity because I really think of these as you know, stuff that you need to do quickly. Otherwise there'll be competition. Otherwise the opportunity will vanish. And so 100% I have that mentality of get things done right now. And I would say it's actually very apt for the AI world because it is moving so incredibly quickly. Not a week passes by without another model breakthrough, um, without somebody else getting another amazing product done. Um, and that was an, an essential part of the mentality that I brought to the team. Um, remember, we announced Cartex AI as a product in November. We said we were going to be doing this. We said private preview. It went into GA three weeks ago. That is unheard of pace in enterprise software, but that's what you need to succeed today. Um, and uh, rather than wartime CEO, I would stress that the quality that I bring to the table is to, f is to make my teams have the gas pedal floored even when we are ahead, even when it's not wartime, because to me, that is what creates sustained success. Yeah, speed has never been more important. Okay, so we call, we, we identify what Snowflake did as, sometimes we call it the fifth data platform, separating yep. compute from storage, simplifying cloud data warehouse, making you know, infinite scalability. Yep. So people want to know, are you a data cloud? Are you a data AI cloud? Are you an AI company? Are you an application <laughs> platform? Are you all of the above? Uh, the best way that I can answer this is to start with you know, two words that you used, is a data cloud. But what is, let's unpack that, what does it really mean? We think of ourselves as a cloud computing platform, but centered on data. And so we absolutely want to be the best platform that there is for storing data, for running data processing, that's the core. That compute engine um, that is so magical, that's the core of Snowflake. And we're expanding it. Again, things like Iceberg, Polaris, or hybrid tables, which is for transactional data, it expands that core. But over time, we have added on capabilities like collaboration that make us much more useful in a interconnected network sort of world. And AI, I honestly see as a horizontal layer. It's a little bit like mobile phones. Every company was affected by mobile. I think it's the same with AI. Um, simply because it's almost a new, new human computer interface. So you see us do things both at a platform layer, like Cortex AI, meaning any analyst can use AI, any Python writer can use AI, but we also develop application level things, um, where for example, um, a, an analyst can set up a pipeline to extract structured data, say from contracts, super easily. So AI is one of these pervasive technologies, but at our core, our thesis is that a cloud that's centered on data is a more useful product for customers, is more useful for partners to build on, and that's the vision that we have. It's really the chapters that you outlined, strong data core, collaboration as a very powerful um, business enabler, and then AI um, and applications as this next generation of things that can make Snowflake stronger. And that was enabled by the very tight integration, the very efficient compute engine that you had. I remember Sridhar, it was 2022, yeah. in the keynote, uh, Benoit's keynote, he asked how many people have even heard of Iceberg, yep. and just a handful of, my. One of, I was one of the few hands that went up, and now today, it's, it's all the talk, and so you have talked about Iceberg going on, on the offense, and I want to I want to understand this and unpack it a little bit, because yep. you've got this very tight integration, which is your core value proposition, and now you've got this tension uh, to go open. Yep. The more open you, you are, generally, it's more difficult to have control and governance. How are you squaring that circle? Help us understand that. I think this is a great question. Um, I think a lot of it is driven by broad industry trends. Um, and the thing that we are hearing from our largest customers is the data interoperability so that yes, Snowflake can act on data, can write data, be the good steward of data, but however, they don't want to be in the business of making a copy of the data anytime they want to, let's say, write a program and run on top of that data. So they want that data interoperability. Um, but we still bring value to the table um, uh, in terms of helping our customers efficiently do the bulk of data processing on their data. What I think of 
um, when you, you talked about you know playing the offense here with Iceberg is like you know supporting the Iceberg format, leaning into it with the Polaris catalog lets us bring the power of Snowflake to all of the data that a customer has, not just the part that they brought into Snowflake, and especially in the world of AI with lots of unstructured data, lots more things to be doing, bringing our efficient compute engine to act on all of the data is going to be uh, you know, a big business unlock for us. So there is a world in which there'll be data that is not governed as tightly. Maybe it's like broadly governed, and there'll be high quality data that Snowflake manages, and is really saying that both of these are fine, and people perhaps will do coarse grain permissioning on one side, and do finer grain permissioning for the data that really matters, the heart of the heart in Snowflake. I don't think of these as contradictions. I think of these as opportunities where we can help our customers do more. I want to push on that a little bit, because this is a really key issue. So okay, so you've got Polaris, it's open source, Yep. You're the main committer, but you've got other folks That's right. as That's well. Right. But, but, you're, but Horizon is the, the real governance fine jewelry. Is that, is that fair to say? And that's going to be inside of Snowflake. You've got to be inside of Snowflake to really take advantage of that. So I'm hearing a best of both worlds. Right? It, it, I am help 100%. Us, help yeah. us understand, because you're, you're not giving away your core IP, to the, to the world, you're allowing that core IP to be tapped if you're inside a snowflake, so that kind of protects your moat, if you will, if I can use that term. At the same time, you're opening up with Polaris to a much wider audience, which I could argue gets them interested in Snowflake and maybe brings them in for that high quality, high ex, you know, touch experience that they need. Am I getting it? You're absolutely getting it. Um, and uh, yes, it is a little bit of how do we get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. um, the data that is inside Snowflake, it has been curated, it has been governed, it, these are the crown jewels of a, uh, of, of a company. Um, and uh, things like Horizon, um, which is all around uh, you know, better governance, better catalog, better sharing within an enterprise. These are all qualities that uh, um, we, do, we do bring, um, but I would say that the primary value prop of Snowflake is like this incredibly tightly integrated platform that lets you do data engineering, data processing in Python, SQL, machine learning algorithms, as well as AI in one tight compute engine. And overall, uh, making it possible for our customers to act on all of their data, understanding that some things are going to be better curated, more tightly curated than others, um, I, I see this as actually a strict win. Uh, over time, of course, we want people to have that mentality about all of the data that they have, but let's face it, lots of customers have 100 times as much data sitting in cloud storage as inside Snowflake, and so embracing that opportunity, working with people, um, feels like the right thing for us to do. So, last question on this. So yes. by, by having a true open source Polaris, yep. uh, that attracts folks, but you've then got to have the best product and the best experience for that's Horizon, right, that's and that's right, how that's you right, win. That's right, that's right. Um, having the world's best compute engine, having the world's best collaboration, um, the higher level functionality, having the world's best AI when it comes to creating AI applications, um, that is how we win. Um, it's absolutely going to be a competitive space, but you need to have a world leading product um, and, uh, and, and not be in like the custom format space, I actually think that that ship is sailing. So there's a perception from some customers that I've talked to, that, oh, we do the data engineering work outside of Snowflake because it's too expensive. First of all, I've never seen the analysis done. Yep. Maybe I have to go do it myself. That's, uh, I, I, I have I'll seen put lots of analysis. I, <laughs> I'll have stuff to say about that. Uh, yep. Okay, so, so uh, help us understand that because, but, but the way I look at it is you've got streaming, you've got analytics, you've got machine learning, you've got gen AI, and you've got data engineering all inside of the, the very efficient Snowflake, one engine, one set of metadata, and yep. there's, there's clearly value there. So it's a value discussion, not just necessarily a you know, TCO piece. We all understand TCO is not the, necessarily the acquisition cost or one little slice, it's the whole picture. So if you have data on that, I'd love for you to share it. Uh, so we have done lots of migrations of data engineering workloads, say from open source, you know, things like Spark over to Snowflake, and we consistently find um, that those pipelines are way more efficient. We are also making it much simpler to create data pipelines with things like dynamic tables. Uh, dynamic tables is basically a way for you to specify a SQL query 
to create a table and then say, I want this data refreshed you know, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every 30 minutes. And you can string together a sequence of these to create a pipeline, no complex engineering required, and stuff is just recomputed in place. And now if you combine that with Iceberg support, you can run Snowflake data engineering on any portion of your pipeline. Uh, most of our customers find that we're actually incredibly efficient for cases like this, whether it is a small job or a giant job, and now the benefit with AI is that if you want to run models as part of your data engineering pipelines, those are just SQL commands. You don't need to spin up GPUs, you don't need to make another commitment. We make all of that possible out of the box, and that's the magic of Snowflake, which is that tightly integrated you know, platform that just gets the job done. And I'm guessing this has resonated well with the 100 plus customers that you've talked to. Your challenge is to uh, uh, make that appeal or that make that case to the non-Snowflake customers, is that fair? 100%. I think the broader appeal is going to be important. We have close to 10,000 customers. That list is, uh, is growing. Uh, but we are investing more, for example, uh, for the data scientists. We have a notebook offering that also went into public preview. Um, I've personally used it, being a, a product guy myself. Uh, it's amazingly easy to use. It's tightly integrated with, uh, with Snowflake. Um, and it's also, it's also long overdue. Uh, and so we see things like that as appealing to the different uh, audiences that are within, within an org. It's as much as, uh, an issue of winning their hearts and minds as it is of just functionality. You mentioned something in the last earnings call that I want to ask you about. Yep. You talked about a, a, a Snowflake schema to make it possible to people have a conversation with it, giving semantic information. That's right. The That's example right. you, you used here is give Mar uh, Mike Scarpelli an app that knows about finance. Yep. What we're talking about here is billings means the same thing for every single app. It's been very difficult to, to, to for organizations, technology companies to, to, <laughs> to, to create that capability broadly. That's right. Why has it been so difficult and what's the scope of that statement? Uh, well, let, let me give you an analogy. Like, uh, you know, in my house, for example, there are like 30 things that are like kind of not working quite perfectly. <laughs> they kind of work, but you know, they kind of don't. Do I want to go fix all of them one week? No. It like, takes an enormous amount of time. I'm like, where's the utility? Um, and I would say semantic catalog projects suffer from this issue that in any big organization, there's just lots of stuff. There's legacy. And, and saying you're going to be pristine perfect is just not a thing that people can afford to do because the ROI is not clear. It's an infinity of work for what's the gain. Um, when I talked about semantic catalog, I was meaning it in the context of Cortex Analysts, which went into public preview yesterday. The idea is that if you do a small amount of work, that cleans up a schema, meaning it tells, the, it tells the AI model what the schema is about, so that it unifies words like billings. You know, it has a specific meaning at Snowflake. Revenue has a specific meaning at Snowflake. If you can, if you can do that, all of a sudden, there's an unlock of, here is a finance app that Mike can use. I think this, the, an effort like this is immediately tied into value. And by the way, we have another product announcement where we're using the power of language models to create additional semantic information. And so I would broadly say semantic models as a concept, as a broad concept, are really hard because a lot of people have to do a lot of work without necessarily seeing value. I think part of what AI can do is create value in these pockets because if you tell somebody, wait, you can make your analysts a whole lot more efficient because most common questions can be asked and answered directly by Cortex analysts, that is incentive to create that semantic catalog. And by the way, we will also interoperate, if somebody has already done a semantic catalog, we will ingest that into Cortex analysts so that they can use the investments that they already have. But to me, this is much more of a, you know, do work as you need, as opposed to making a massive investment. But it sets up a really interesting strategic discussion. As you come from the bottom up, yeah. you don't really have all the, the business, you don't have the business logic embedded today in your apps, you're just getting started, uh, is the assumption that with this Gen AI era, we're going to create a new set of data apps that could be highly disrupted, disruptive to the existing application ecosystems that are out there and blow us away with, with new function, new capabilities, and, and that's how this new era will evolve. Uh, you're asking a great question, which is what is the impact of language models, their fluency with language, their ability to sift through data, their ability to use a tool like issue a piece of SQL 
Um, I think that chapter is like still being written. As you know, uh, like last year, famously, we talked about how search was going to get massively disrupted, and oops, it did not get as massively disrupted. Um, I do think that AI technologies are basically going to have a huge impact on how information is going to get consumed, whether these are narrow apps that specific people can use and not really like the broad business intelligence layer, I think is a little bit of an open question. Mm. Um, but the reason we at Snowflake are very interested in this area is because we think of it as a massive business unlock because every business user can now directly interact with Snowflake. And so we want to be there to create that value. We have great partnerships with all of the BI companies. We're going to continue to work with them. And honestly, no one knows how all this is going to turn out. We know that the future is going to be different, but I think it's an open call where it's going to end up. And we also know it comes back to the data. Sridhar, thanks so much for spending some time. I know you're super busy. Really appreciate your time on theCUBE. Thank you, this is an amazing conversation. Uh, Thank you, you for your time. You bet. All right, keep it right there, we're right back. Right after this short break, this is Dave Vellante for Rebecca Knight. You're watching theCUBE.